All right, we're at the uh, 210 uh, in the auditorium. This is empowering connection between data and relationships. We have Josh Mate, uh, Chief Marketing Officer of Relationship Science, and Sarah Williams. Uh, she is a lead uh, analyst and consultant at Marks and Lundy. Welcome. So, uh, okay. that's a good way to start off. Thank you. So, I'm going to give you a little context because late night, not too many nights ago, I'll be honest with you, we were thinking through how do we present this and um, you know, thinking through how we can best start to talk about the relationship between data and relationships and how we can use that more. We started to get a little bit punchy thinking about, you know, we're looking at the future and it got a little ugly and we got into Star Trek. So I will just warn you that we are we're thinking about the future, thinking about Star Trek. I am not a Trekkie. If you ask me anything about that, I'm going to have to leave the room. But you, you've walked into what we are thinking about as the future of really pulling data into the relationship building business. And as we get into that, I just wanted to take a moment and think back. And as I was thinking about this, and kind of the history of data and the nonprofit sector, it almost seems like it snuck up on the nonprofit sector. That the sector had been going along, fundraising had been going along quite a long time. This is the, the timeline of Martin Lundy. And Martin Lundy is a consulting firm um, that works with nonprofit organizations on fundraising. We were formed in 1926. We didn't even start thinking about data and analytics. 2002. And to give you a little context, when Martin Lundy was thinking about hiring someone to start the Analytical Solutions Division, I was interviewed along with many. I probably was the least qualified for this position. And I was later told that I was hired because they thought I could be trained to do something else when data failed. So that's how much faith <laughs> in 2002. <laughs> which really wasn't that long ago that people had in that data was going to really start driving the decisions, the strategic planning in this sector. And I was, as I was starting to think about this session, um, a couple months ago I was having dinner with someone who's a, he's a VP of a top boarding school on the East Coast. He's been in this business a long time. He's actually starting to think about, you know, exiting out of this sector in this business, and he, he raised a really interesting question. And he asked me, you know, you throw a lot of data at clients now, and especially at boards. We, we, we do a lot of presenting of data at the board level and thinking about campaigns and investment to build up campaigns. And he asked me, do you ever worry that you're moving people away from the point? That you throw up all this data, and that the point is has always been and is always going to be getting people around the table who care about the same things and are thinking about their philanthropic decisions. And I thought that was a, it's a really interesting question coming from someone who is a data believer and has seen the strength of data in this sector and is just questioning how we are positioning data moving forward. Although I, I've never been in a meeting where a woman is leaning across the table this way, so it's the best we can do. Um, one of the things that, that Martin Lundy does a lot is we, we don't necessarily throw a lot of new data at clients, but we help them start to synthesize the data that they already have. So we take the existing data in the database and we start the, the staff and the board uh, the decision maker is thinking about what does all this data mean in terms of what can you raise moving forward. And so one of the, one of the big picture slides that we show boards and we show staff is when we've taken all this data and we've synthesized who are your top prospects and what are the conversion ratios you might see, we put a number in front of them and we say, you know, this is a realistic campaign range for your organization moving forward. And then we leave the room. And they're left with this big number. And it, it made me think about that conversation I was having um, with the VP at the boarding school, that are we making it too easy? Are we not really relaying these numbers back to the fact 
that in the end, if you don't have those relationships, the, the data doesn't mean anything. And so Josh and I started talking about how, how we take this and we make sure that it always comes back to this and that we're, we're using all the tools in front of us to make sure that we don't lose sight of just crunching data, but that we're taking that data and using it in a way that gets us to this point. And so it's almost, it's almost looking at the future by taking the past and what's in front of us now and making sure that we're putting it together in a way that we can really work most effectively and efficiently for our organizations. And we're, we're new at this, and it's really pulling our tools together. And so I'm gonna get out of the way because what Josh is gonna show you is super cool. But what we would ask of you is when, when we get to the end, we're really trying to figure out what the future looks like. And so we would love your input after we get through all this and if you're lucky enough to give us some good input, maybe you'll actually be one of these people up here. We'll, we'll start putting names to it. I claim her, so you can't have her. But some of these characters are up for grabs, so just keep it in mind. Hi, everybody. Um, I love what I'm introduced as having something super cool. Uh, it scares me, but I'm going to try. Um, as a CMO, I think, you know, I always have technology companies coming to me and trying to sell me things, and they often have tons of bells, um, they always have lots of bells and whistles, probably too many bells and whistles. Technology companies often have tons of bells and whistles, and sometimes it's nice to have tight, well-defined value propositions. And I, I think that's what we have here today. Um, what I want to spend a little time talking about is this idea around relationship capital, and how what we have found in about a year of selling commercially is that organizations, whether they're for-profit or non-profit, often struggle to really leverage this relationship capital as fully as they can. So I think all of us over the last five years have become, or we think we've become, really great networkers. We've got robust LinkedIn accounts, and we think we can, uh, some of us really can, and maybe some of us can't, but we all think we're good networkers. But what we have found is that organizations, at an organizational or an institutional level, it's often more difficult to leverage all of the relationship capital and strength of the organization. And so that's kind of really what we're helping institutions do. I should go back to this. Mm -hmm. Hello. It's on. Hello. Thank you. Um, so when we think about relationship capital, which is a little bit of a fancy jargony term, we think about all of the connections that an organization has, not only their direct relationships, but who their direct relationships know. Um, as many of you probably experience, you have often very powerful boards or powerful senior executives, and I think the question is, or the pain point that I think we're solving is, how do they leverage, how do you leverage those relationships to the fullest in an efficient way that takes you out of Excel sheets gives you actionable data, puts it on your phone, puts it in an easy to use format, which I'll show you in a second. Um, we have basically built out a platform where we have modeled out um, kind of a curated universe of about 3.5 million 
decision makers, important individuals at a range of companies, as well as their organizations. So we collect tens of thousands of data points on these folks. We bring it into an easy to access platform, and then we allow organizations to map themselves to that universe, to understand their connectivity and relationship capital. And I'll show that to you, it's much more interesting than me talking about it. I'll be done with this in a second. So we're a technology company. Um, our founder is a guy who built a company called Capital IQ that if you were talking to folks in the financial industry, they probably have heard of it. I think the reason it's relevant for this crowd is, is that um, we, place, we place a premium on security, large bits of information. So our heritage is in that world and I think why that's relevant. We've got a lot of people, so we're kind of a strange young company. Those consist of researchers, people pulling in this data, people building the software and supporting it. And we're headquartered in New York City. Um, a couple of things we're not, right? Because everybody looks at us and I think likes to put labels on us. So we're not a social network, right? We're not, um, we're, we're really building proprietary things for organizations because a lot of the companies we work with, they don't really want to share their relationships with the world, right? It's one of their primary assets and they don't want to broadcast it socially. Um, we're not a traditional CRM system, although we do integrate with CRM systems, including a recent integration with Salesforce. Um, and we're not a contact database. So those three million plus records, we're not giving out uh, phone numbers or email addresses. We probably would have been out of business about six months ago as the ultimate spam machine if we had done that. So what we're trying to do is provide our clients with a level of insights and intelligence about their universe, about how they map to the universe we've mapped out, and then there's work to be done about how you navigate and build those relationships. I mean, I think there's some line we talk about the art and the science, and we think we're trying to bring a little science, but a lot of our clients are very artful at building those relationships. Um, we, uh, we raised a lot of money to build this. These are some of the influential folks who are behind us. I think the interesting part about this is that these people invested in us when we were a concept on a napkin. And I think the reason they did that was is because they saw themselves in this product because they probably built their own careers based on being smart about their relationships. Um, so we have about 350 institutional clients in about a year of selling. About a third of those are nonprofits, which we're excited about. And I'll talk more about this, but we feel like we're delivering a lot of value. We have some stories to share around that today. Um, so about a third of them, it's higher ed, cause-based, arts and culture all across the map, and really big or small. So a nice diverse range, and you know, I hope we listen every day and, and try to get smarter about a segment we're learning about. Um, and they're the Lego friends. So I, I point to three main things that I think we do well. They're simple. I think we help optimize your board and senior folks. I think we're good at discovering who are high impact donors who might you want to bring into your world, and more importantly, which are the ones you have access to. Um, I, I was doing a case study phone call the other day with a nonprofit client and he threw out the word strategy that this helps him be more strategic, which can often be an empty word, and so I said, what does that actually mean? And his point of view was, he actually can spend time on the opportunities that are real because he understands his access points better. And I thought that was actually a decent definition of the word strategy. So I think we do number two pretty well. And I think we provide a level of intelligence about your donor base and your potential donor base. And therefore that can, if used optimally, shorten the fundraising cycle. So three kind of very simple ideas. I'll walk you through that with the product. I'm gonna skip this slide for timing. Um, pricing wise, just to give you a sense of it, we price just basically based on a user on a user level. So small organizations where we have one to three users that might be a prospect researcher, a frontline fundraiser, maybe the head of development or advancement, um, to larger organizations. And we're working with all different sorts. And uh, you know, a couple of things I, I point out here. Um, we've spent a lot of money to build a real strong support structure, so we're we're not a faceless software company. I think we have a large research team that really, I'll show you what that means in a second, but it, it allows our clients to get kind of 
research done using our team on individuals they want to know more about. So there's a, a people element, not just the software element, which I think is uh, translating into a lot of value for our clients. Um, CRM and integrations, I heard Salesforce speak earlier today. We just launched our first integration with Salesforce. Other CRMs are on our list. Everybody's talking about integration, so uh, we're going to make that happen in the right way. And uh, that's about it. We've got a lot of support that we put behind us. Now I'm zooming out and in. Uh, and I just spoke to all this. You know, we're mobile, we got an iPad, iPhone, all that fun stuff. And uh, I'm going to go into the product, actually. This is the not smart thing to do, which is to do a live demo of a product with, uh, that requires Wi-Fi. Okay, so this is the platform. Um, I, I pulled up a, a somewhat random profile this morning for a guy named Dan who was a co-founder in a place called Mavron, which Howard Schultz is it's his investment arm. Um, the first thing we do with our clients is, is that we try to match their relationships to the system. So you see this number over here, 250. Um, this is my fictional Pam Kelly, who is a director of development at Charity Water. And we do implementations with clients differently, but the key thing we're trying to do is we're trying to match relationships to this system against the universe of people that we've modeled out. We do this different ways. Some people will say, here are the 10 most senior folks in the organization. They're all gonna take a CSV file of all their relationships. They're gonna match it. Others will take uh, their database or a section of their database and match it, and every user will have access to it. Um, the important thing is that those 250 relationships, the system is saying, I have an extended network of 132,000 people I potentially have access to through my relationships. I hope that makes sense. It's a little tricky. Um, and all safe and secure. So that number, those relationships, they don't benefit the overall database. They don't benefit any other client of ours. They're totally secure just to that client and I think that's a really important point. Um, so if I go back to Dan. <laughs> so the first thing that I think it distinguishes us and it's really our sweet spot is around this idea of access, right? So the first thing off the bat what I'm seeing here is that out of my 250 relationships, we actually have four in common. So if I scroll over this little bar here, right, it shows me that I said to the system, I know this guy who's a founder. We think there's a relationship between him and Dan. The data point is that they both have a relationship to Harvard University. And that allows us to draw a fair amount of relationship likelihood. In this case, we're saying it's strong. When we look at a data point like this, we look at like 20 different things. Were these two senior folks to each other? Was this a three-person board or a 50-person board? Um, did this happen 25 years ago or two years ago? So we're, we're looking at a lot of different factors to try to make this system as smart as possible. Um, I think we do a pretty good job illuminating relationships and showing connectivity. Now granted, these two people could hate each other and we wouldn't know it, but I think we're trying to deliver insights and intelligence about how you might have reach. So I'll scroll over one other just to show you. So here you're seeing a company connection, right? Um, I sell to the system, I know William. We think William and Dan have a relationship through drugstore.com. So we're looking at company information, corporate boards, nonprofit boards, investments, once again, tons of data to try to illuminate connectivity. And if I was sharing with my colleagues, which we encourage obviously, here are four other insights into ways I might be able to get Dan if he was a prospect for me. So um, Scott Davis, who's a colleague, right? He says he knows Ralph James, and Ralph has a connection through Harvard as well. Let's look at this one. These two are two colleagues. They have direct relationships with Howard, and we see the data points that support that relationship. So I, I think the takeaway from this is from an access standpoint, 
Here are basically eight potential insights. Some of them are going to be good, some of them are going to be bad, but they're giving you ideas about how your relationships can potentially get you to somebody. If I wanted to go deeper, I'm going to show you one other quick thing. Um, when we look at a profile, we also identify the number of, we, we basically draw a picture of their ecosystem. In this case, we've identified 900 relationships that we think Dan has. And as a user, you can go start going through all them, right? You can say, these people look interesting. We've been trying to get to Potbelly Corporation. Let's look and see how we potentially have a relationship in here. So before when I was talking about leveraging board members, right? You can imagine the power of really seeing into your board's universe of relationships in kind of a very quick, instant view. And we could go, go through these entire 900 relationships and pick out ones of interest and understand them a little bit better. So I could say, oh, this is interesting. This is a person I've been trying to get to. He's a CEO at Potbelly. Here's the relationship. Let's go check him out. And then once again, I could do my diligence on how this person's connected. And for this person who's president and CEO, sorry, once again, I'm seeing common relationships, colleague relationships, and I'm getting insights about how our organization might be able to connect. I could even go deeper to get even further access by going into this tool called Pathfinder. Pathfinder is kind of as it sounds, right? It's literally taking my first degree relationships and it's drawing path to any entity in our system. And an entity could be a person, it could be an organization, it could be a list of prospects. Um, and so I'd say this, this relationship mapping technology to an extent represents the heart of the system, right? The ability to use your relationships strategically to map yourself. I often think of a bullseye, right? So there's first, there's you and your relationships. The outer circle is your colleagues and how you leverage them, and that could be senior executives in the organization, that could be your board potentially. And then I also think there's an external constituency. So we have clients who will create a list of, let's say, their top 25 donors or top or 10 corporate uh, sponsors or whatever it might be, and then they'll use this tool to run paths from that as opposed to from themselves. So we're probably learning about new use cases with this tool every day. I think we probably know about half of them. Um, but this is, once again, a fairly sophisticated tool where you can leverage relationships both within your organization and external to it. The next thing I want to talk about is the idea of identification. This is actually pretty straightforward. You could imagine the ability to query this database and this platform in pretty sophisticated ways to identify people of interest who might support your cause. So um, I'll do a silly one where I'll just say, I'm from New York. And I want to see, uh, you know, public company, chief executive officers totally making this up. You can sort based on school, you can base, sort based on affiliation, and basically what this is gonna do, hopefully rather quickly, is create an instant kind of target list, right? Based on whatever criteria you want. And I think the really interesting thing of this is, aside from the ability to get smart, a smart list pretty quickly based on a wide range of criteria, let's give it a second to load. So what's cool here is, this gives me 820 results, which is kind of a big, somewhat unwieldy list. But when we put everything through a relationship filter, it comes back that two of those people are actually people I know, right? So they're actually right there. And then my colleagues can connect me potentially to 65 of them. And it's going to show me the detail about you know, who's, who the relationship is shared by, why they're appearing in this list. And then through my extended network, I have about 245 relationships. So I think the whole power of this is to see everything through the relationship capital of the organization. Um, next up, I just want to quickly talk about it. I'm going to stop talking so much. Um, I want to talk about intelligence, because I think this is an intelligence platform as well. Um, when we pull up a person profile, 
we are going to go deep in what we're able to collect on them. So aside from the relationship insights, we're going to find relevant family, education, career, corporate boards, uh, sorry, I'm a Mac user, so I don't use PCs, um, nonprofit boards, we're going to collect um, nonprofit donation data where we can, and obviously there's some limitations regarding timing about that, but this can at least give a sense of affiliation. We could click in here if we wanted to, I'll just show quickly, and actually see um, not only the recipient, but at a cause-based level where their affiliation lies. And um, just going back a second, we'll collect stuff like political donations, compensation data, events they may have attended, creative works. So a deep amount of data um, on individuals. And just as we do it for an individual, we also can do it for a organization level. There's about a million organizations, a million nonprofits, financial, corporate institutions. Um, and just to give you a sense of that, we're identifying who are the key executives, who's on the board of directors, who are some of the insider holders, who are some of the institutional holders, um, have there been any recent transactions, who are their advisors, who are their clients. So it's all, none of this is to be used to make any type of financial decision, but this just gives you, once again, a view into the relationship ecosystem or the relationship capital of the organization. It can be powerful for our clients. Um, the only other thing I just show you on intelligence is, is we launched a product probably about three to four months ago. We call it 360 Alerts. This is a push piece of content. Um, I, I like to think of it as like people-based news. So um, you know, if you took your top 50 donors or top 50 prospective donors, and you wanted to make sure you were up to date with anything happening in their world, which is impossible, pretty impossible to stay on top of all your key relationships. This is delivered in an email digest every morning. Um, it's also in the platform and integrated into the platform. Um, and what's interesting is, is that even things that wouldn't necessarily appear in the news, like somebody does something with their executive comp, or there's a transaction, or there's a donation, we can surface those alerts on a people basis and you know, I think the end benefit is we're keeping our clients smart about the people that matter to them. My last quick thing, and then I'm gonna stop, is around strategy. Um, and this is an alpha tool that I just think is worth sharing. It, it goes to the key concept around relationship capital. But the basic idea is, as an organization, how do you get a bird's eye view, make strategic decisions about whether it's types of people you wanna reach, sectors where you have strength, or even based on geography. So the ability to say, huh, you know, let's look at telecommunications as a sector. We have some good donors or some good relationships or partnerships there. Let's see where we have those relationships based on our direct and extended network. Let's see where we're at weak, weakness, where we have, we're at risk, where we don't have relationships, and try to make strategic decisions based on that. So this is, a, I think, a reporting type analytic dashboarding type tool for senior decision makers at an organization, just to be smart about where they have strength and where they don't and how they can do it. Um, my last thing, um, I, I just mentioned the service component. So there's three scenarios we face with our clients. Number one, they find an error in this type of database and there will be errors in this type of data. And we built uh, a service infrastructure where within 48 hours we're gonna try to fix that error as long as we can find a publicly available piece of data. The second thing is often a profile won't be deep enough and a client wants more and they can basically say, go find more and a person based in New York will get back to them within 48 hours and say, here's what we found. And then there will also be folks in here that, um, that are not in the platform that should be and you know, we have clients who will submit a list of 50 to 100 prospects and we'll go do the research to do that. Now, I think our, both our competitive distinctness and our, our ability to function as a business is at that decision maker level, right? If you're a, you know, a junior person and you're 24, there's probably, probably not a ton of publicly available information on you, so we're gonna struggle there, right? That's not a sweet spot for us. But I think where we excel is, as you're trying to reach kind of those important people, um, this is a scientific way to do it. Um, 
so yeah, CRM integrations are important. Service and support is important. Um, our apps are pretty slick and cool, to use Sarah's word. And uh, and I think we have a, we just have a couple of stories. Uh, sure. that you, want to come up with? you have to shout. Them. Okay, shout from the audience. Thank you. Hi. Good afternoon. Sarah Williams in the analytics division. And what I'm going to do today is just talk about how we intersect the, the work on the analytics side with the relationship piece for one of our clients. Um, one of my clients was Wake Forest University. And what we did was we looked at what their campaign capacity was. All right, here we go. Uh, we were looking at what their capacity looked like, and as Sarah was showing you in that first chart, you had a bunch of numbers and um, names and, and by capacity level, but for Wake Forest, they had to do what, what Howard talked about this morning, is make the human connection. And so I just wanted to share with you just three ways that this client is using the analysis that we did on capacity of their, you know, their prospect pool and they knew the people very close to them, but they didn't know the middle group and the less known group and how they use relationship science to fill in those gaps of knowledge. So the first story from Wake Forest was um, they were all sitting around a room and they were talking about a couple of 10 million plus donors or prospective donors with financial capacity who made a gift or two, but no one really knew who they were. And so what um, my contact there did was she quickly looked up in relationship science this person's name and it linked to her connections that she had through Wake Forest to make that connection for that major gift officer and say, hey, you know, John Doe actually knows Barry, who is a friend of our, one of our board members. So what it did for her was to take that middle group that we talked about in our capacity analysis that they kind of knew to um, make that connection a little bit stronger. And so he was able to go and reach out to that one person to help open that door for John Doe. <coughs> the second um, way they've used this information was, and I thought this was really very, very innovative on their part, they, um, they had a bunch of new parents coming in and at new parent orientation, they had them fill out you know, a contact sheet. What was their name, where they worked, what their title was, and they had run them through wealth screening. And what they, what they did was they found a bunch of people who had vice president level, CEO level, who came in with a very low wealth screening capacity rating. And so what, the, what she did was she went into the database to find out more about these new parents, you know, who had lower capacity but had a vice president, president level. And she was able to see if there were any connections to current donors in her database, um, where they were giving, and um, what boards they were on, and then begin to understand, okay, you know, as these new parents were coming in, um, she had them assigned to major gift officers so that they had sort of built those connections early on so that when new parents were coming in, uh, the major gift officers could start these conversations with the person, you know, new parents. The, the third way was, they, um, they used that less known group that I talked about earlier with the capacity analysis to understand, you know, that they knew they had high capacity, but they hadn't been giving to Wake Forest. So they were trying to find out where the intersection of their, their uh, individuals within their donor database matched with philanthropic interest um, for, you know, larger initiatives they were hoping to do. So for example, um, they were looking at a fine arts building and so they can query the database and find out, okay, which one of our donors also has an interest and has been giving to similar types of organizations. And um, so those are just quickly three ways our client was using both the data that they had gathered from us and made, it, made that human connection um, that we, again, I've heard all day today about you know, the importance of making that human connection. So Sarah queued up some questions, and this is now the time for Q&A. Um, and apparently you're going to be on one of these guys if you answer the questions, right? So are there any, you want to guys want to come? 
Well, and I think one of the things that we would love to, I know it's the end of a long day, but you know, this is this is fairly new to us in the integration of these tools and relationship sciences. I mean, you've only been working with nonprofits for a year. And so I, I think what we'd love in the in the last few minutes is to really pick your brains and, and you know, we, we've kind of experienced in the last few months how we've started to use this tool and integrate with the analysis that we're doing, but would love your feedback and, and thoughts about how you would use this or are there similar ways that you're digging into this within your organizations? Yeah. The, uh, so at a high level, right, it's inclination and capacity, right? So you're, you're finding the people that are connected to your organization, finding the people the highest capacity, lowest capacity, wherever you're looking for your donors, typically at the higher capacity. Um, as I was listening to the stories, um, there is this that intersection between appropriate use of wealth screening and managing that managing that wealth screening appropriately from a from a relationship management point of view. I think, sir, you pointed out that you had they they screened some incoming parents and they sort of did uh, some additional research to kind of look at titles and said, hey, you have, you have these people with a level of you know, higher titles, lower capacity, let's go and look at and, and find some more information about them, right? And it sounded like they were going in and we were finding maybe some financial information, but also some uh, nonprofit support. So I think that intersection between sort of those sort of tool sets, right, because it's sort of, Relationship science seems like it's coming from the relationship aspect and having some financial data, whereas most of your well screening tools are right coming from that sort of capacity perspective. And then you know, you're you're looking at capacity and then trying to say, hey, yeah, they've already got some information with our organization. You know, we should put them on some sort of solicitation trail. Yeah, and, and one of the interesting things is, you know, where. Where we've seen, and we've only had a limited number of, of clients who, who are working with us in relationship science, but where we've seen the power of this is when you can get the board, your, your boards to upload contacts. And when I, I had a really interesting conversation um, with a client the other day where the board was really pushing back on this. They didn't want to hand over all of, all of their contacts. You know, I, I went through the process, I tested it out, so you basically, you upload your, your Outlook, your LinkedIn, all of the contacts, it takes five minutes, but the board members were pushing back on, we don't want to give up this information. So one of the board members who was, was completely sold on this actually did a, a demo himself with the board. Did it with a board member, pulled up his information, and the power of just showing that this information was correct and that we could get to some of these people that we've been talking about that know have an interest in us, may not be our closest relationships, but they also have the capacity. That was enough and that board, 100%, they were ready to go. So I think it just that the power of, you, you kind of already know, you, you know these people and when we do this analysis, we'll see kind of that middle tier that has a lot of capacity, a bit of a relationship, but not your strongest relationship, and how do you access that given the tools that you have? And it was a really interesting conversation where the board saw that immediately. And, but those are the contexts you really need to get to make this an effective tool for you. Yeah? Your, your comments sort of brought up one question I had. So from an overall implementation perspective, um, is, that the right, is that the right approach? Start with your board, get them to put your board contacts in, and then, and then you're going to be, uh, you may have more relationship matches with your major donors based on the environments that your board has connections in, has worked in. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, 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 there's ideal implementation, which Sarah just spoke to, and then you're always going to have some, or sometimes, sometimes you're going to have some pushback. I think what's good is that um, generally the board members are profiled in the system. And so while it's not level one, which I would say is their outlook contacts or their actual contacts, we're able to get a view into their ecosystem because they're going to be in this system. And so I, I think, you know, we, there's been a lot of different implementations we've done and some are awesome and some are okay and some are good and, you know, we just got to figure out the right way to approach with our clients and create moments like Sarah described where we can show the power of it and I think that usually delivers results. Well, in, in, in the case of Wake Forest, um, 
you know, one of the reasons they were looking at their new parents, too, is, is building that future pipeline because they, they knew that parents were leaving as their children were leaving and, you know, getting in that new group of um, parents engaged early on before their kid would, before they were junior and they're like, oh, they have capacity and they've been giving to us for three years. It was a way to sort of build that future um, piece of it. Yeah. So, um, I guess, so could you speak a little bit about um, sort of who your ideal end user is? So, you know, there are a lot of researchers here at the conference that are some IT people that are reporting, but, you know, it seems to me that um, a lot of this data, um, you want to put, you want to put the interface in front of your development directors. So, like, I mean, um, can you talk a little bit about how your clients are using it in terms of who's actually getting dirty in data? You go first, let um, You know, again, in the, you know, I'm going to pick on Blake Forest. Um, but, you know, what they were doing is their major <coughs> officers had, like, they have licenses, and, um, and and they were using that as a way to, to, to look at their, the people they were assigned to and then the new people coming in. But you're absolutely right. It's, it's, but there was also in that room, that discussion, there was that researcher and the research piece too, because one, I think they go hand in hand in trying to understand, you know, this universe. So. Yeah, I mean, I think there's three probably. I mean, I think you got major gift officers, you have a develop executives in the development capacity, and then you have researchers too. That this can make them, I think, more efficient and agile, and give them really quick access to data. Um, that's that I think is very positive. So I think it's I think there's like three different audiences that, um, and it depends on the organization who's getting dirty and, and who's not. Yes. So I'm wondering if uh, Wake Forest had to overcome any sort of data skepticism. Um, I'm with an institution that has used other mapping tools before, and they, to be honest, weren't terribly great. And so a lot of the data we were putting from our top source was either, um, it wasn't wrong always, but it, just, it wasn't very meaningful. Um, there was a lot of noise. And so now there's a sort of once bitten, twice shy attitude towards this approach generally. We recently switched to uh, relationship science. And so I'm wondering if you had any sort of Selling that you needed to do to get people on board with it to trust some of the data. So I, I can actually speak to that personally because you know I I will I will tell you we we have no financial relationship with relationship science, but but the reason that we we've kind of joined forces is because in my role at Martin Lundy I've run into that a lot as well that you get all this data and get super excited about it and then start to dig into it and think oh she this is not correct and. So one of the things that um, the first time Josh and I were talking that really struck me is the team of real people that are accessible at all times to make changes to the data. So a lot, a lot of the, the database resources that are out there that are on charitable giving or this kind of bio, it's all automated. So it's just kind of trolling the web and pulling all this information and there's very little manual implementation of looking at that data. Does it make sense? Do the dates even match, that kind of thing. This is very much, it's, it's a bit smaller, the database at this point, because there is so much manual research that's going into it. And so that, that was one of my first things that I looked at when I started playing with this, is how accurate does it seem? It also goes into so much more depth than I've found with any of these other tools. But it, it is that, I, I mean, aren't there over 100 people that are researchers? I mean, I, you know, I, mean I brought up who, backs us and I think the reason that's relevant is because it gives us some assets that allowed us to build this for two years prior. I, I think you can't do this strictly algorithmically because it just won't be smart enough and John Smith and John Smith will have bad data linked to each other and it doesn't make sense. So I, I'd say obviously we're trying to build more processes that allow us to scale and get bigger but um, you know often like tech blogs will be like oh are you gonna how are you gonna scale this and can you get rid of the people? And the answer is probably no, because if you don't have the people looking at each data point, it, it becomes stupid pretty quickly. But, I, but look, I mean, I said, you know, there, there will be, we will miss things, there will be errors, and that's the way it goes. I think the relationship mapping stuff, I think we're getting pretty good at. Um, and I think a, a fairly sophisticated, um, you know, gift officer, development director, they're gonna be able to pull out insights even if they don't even use the direct path, right? It should trigger ideas, so I think that's, that's how we think about it. 
But we do have a lot of people working on it, too. I did do a test. So I, I looked up someone I knew, and um, the, one of the positions was incorrect. So I called, or maybe I emailed. And I saw, I, I monitored how long it took for that change to take place, and it was like that. So I, I was impressed. I mean, it, I think that manual, there are very few tools out there that really have that manual touch. And that's made a big difference in, in us just researching it and then the few clients that have started to implement. I think there's less of that skepticism. Yeah? I was wondering if there were products versus nicotine. We have some first levels, second levels, first levels. Are you guys any different? Do you think algorithms, what's behind it? Are you better at more accuracy because you have a bunch of scientists later looking at it? It's my favorite question, the LinkedIn question. Um, so I, I, I spend lots of time thinking about this. No, I, I think, I mean, uh, social network, private proprietary network, user-generated content, research-driven content. I think functionality-wise, it's extremely different. There's no connect button. Um, the, the functionality is really geared towards relationship-driven activities. Database of 250 million versus 3.5 curated, <coughs> I think very different. Um, I think depending on who you're trying to reach though, these two tools could easily sit next to each other and just create a longer, more robust list. I think if you're looking for um, a mid-level HR benefits manager and data on that set of folks, we're not gonna be, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna fail at that. Um, so I think, um, I, I think there are major differences between the two. I hopefully just articulated a few of them. Yes. Josh, you mentioned the, the sweet spot in more relationship sciences. Yep. You didn't use those words, those are my words. But what about expand, expanding you know, from a business model standpoint? What, what are you guys looking at getting to quadrant two and quadrant three and picking up you know, that next tier down? Um, so I mean, I, you know, could a decision maker population be 10 million? Pro probably, right? I, I think, um, you know, I also should mention that this is primarily a domestic-based product at this point. It's about 75, 25, and, um, you know, we wanted to get good at something before going east, I guess, then it becomes more challenging. Um, I, I think some of it is going to be client-driven um, because clients are going to tell us about sectors and populations of people, and we're going to go follow them. Um, and then I think part of this is like a spinning vortex because you start profiling out people and they lead you to other organizations and the thing starts spinning and it keeps on going. Um, I, I don't think we have a number in mind. I, I think as CMO I like the idea of being curated and not being noise. Um, I, I'd like to continue that but I, I think there's growth. I, I think it, I, I hope it's primarily client driven. But I don't, I don't know what number that is. Do you have an API to interact with, with the data in terms of uh, pulling that into some modeling or other types of work? We, we, we don't right now. I, I'd say it's on some roadmap in some room. I, I think um, I, I mentioned the CRM thing a couple of times. I think the Salesforce one is kind of cool because it takes some of the pathing stuff and it actually puts it on a lead opportunity or account record. It's pretty different, right, because a traditional CRM is going to manage activity and what you've done. And this is actually doing something completely different, right? It's giving you insights about people and how you can navigate in. So I think at least in this year, my hope would be we do about three to four integrations with CRM players, the typical ones you'd probably think of. Um, but the API thing is somewhere on a product roadmap. I, I don't know where. There's challenges, I mean, I think with that and supporting it, so. Great, thank you so much. And oh, I'm, we know you're, we have the last things in your way to Ken Jennings, so we will let you get there. But we really appreciate the conversation. Um, I think that this is an interesting, it's an interesting way to look forward. So we really appreciate your time and conversation. Thank you. Thank you.